Let me pray. Lord God, what a, what a great song to sing as we um, just begin to open your word and read from the book of 1 Thessalonians this evening. Lord, what a, a great truth and a reminder um, of you, your return. Lord, what a comfort it is to know these things and to put our trust and hope in them. Lord, help us to um, just be affected by your word this evening. Lord, help us to go home um, with a greater love for you and a greater desire to see the lost saved. In your name, amen. Imagine for a second that you are the mother of three teenagers. And your husband has this brilliant idea of sneaking you away to Hawaii out of the blue. You guys are off on a normal date. He says, what do you want to do next? She says, I don't know. He says, well, I've got a plane tickets. We're going. And we're leaving the kids behind. This is probably not the most loving thing a husband can do for his wife. She's probably racing in her mind to think, well, what about the kids who's taking care of them? How can I make sure that they're going to be okay? Um, and so as you think about that, what would your mind go to in the things that you would want to share with your kids as you're about to get on a plane? That text message or email you want to share with your kids when you're functionally pulled away from them at the last minute. That's really what Paul is experiencing here in this letter. I know if I were in that place, I would want to tell them I love them. I'd want to comfort them. I'd want to encourage them that this will be fine. Your dad's crazy, but it'll be fine. I'd probably give them final instructions for like how to eat, make sure the dogs don't die while we're away, remind them to care for each other. Um, and I tell them I can't wait to get back home to them. And that's the message that we're going to read tonight. So let's start in the book of Acts. Turn to Acts chapter 17 with me. In Acts 17, starting in verse 1, God's word says, Now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from scriptures, explaining and settle, setting before them that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I'm proclaiming to you, is that Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with a great multitude of the God-fearing Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews, becoming jealous, taking along some wicked men from the marketplace and forming a mob, set the city in an uproar. And attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out up to the assembly. And when they did not find them, meaning Paul and Silas, they began dragging Jason and some brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also, and Jason has welcomed them. They all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And they disturbed the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. And when they had received the bond from Jason and the others, they released them. And the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. And therefore many of them believed, along with not a few prominent Greek women and men. But when the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul and Berea also, they came there as well, shaking up and disturbing the crowds. Then immediately the brothers sent Paul out to go as far as the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. Now those who es escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they left. They left. 
I've spent most of my adult life reading that passage for face value and believing that Paul was in Thessalonica for three weeks. But as I've studied this book this month, I don't find that conclusion as clear cut. We know Paul was there for at least three weeks, but let's look at a couple of verses in 1 Thessalonians. Go ahead and turn there with me and read um, just some of the story of Paul being there that will help inform the time that we think he's there. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, starting in verse 5, Paul says, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full assurance, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. I believe it took time after the Thessalonians became believers to observe Paul and his traveling companions in this. And then chapter 2, verse 9, it says, For you remember, brothers, our labor and hardship, how working night and day so as to not burden, be a burden to any of you, we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. Once again, they were working night and day. And then going on to verse 14 of chapter 2, he says, For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you also suffered the same things at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and do not please God and are hostile to all men, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved, with the result that they always fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come to them to the utmost. See, Paul's custom was to go to the synagogue first and then to the Gentiles. And we read in Acts 17 that a great multitude of Gentiles, of Greeks, became believers. But Paul says here that he was unable to preach to the Gentiles like was his custom. And so I believe that Paul was in Thessalonica for a very short amount of time. Um, if you take it to like the most three Sabbaths could be, it's about 27 days. So if you start on the day after the Sabbath and end on the day before the Sabbath, that's 27 days. I think he was probably there a little bit more time because there had to be some time for the um, Jews to kind of stir people up to be able to create the mob, to even know where Jason's house was. They were meeting in Jason's house, um, is the assumption. And so when they drug Jason out, they were trying to kind of disturb the meeting of um, the group that were following Paul, what became the church at Thessalonica. And so my guess is they were probably there a couple of months. So it's not strictly speaking three weeks, but it's a very short time. And if we compare that to the time that Paul was in Ephesus, which was several years, this is just a different kind of church. Um, this church um, had their pastor, their, the person that led them to the Lord, that taught them the gospel, pulled from them with no send off in the dark of night to try to escape Jews that were trying to persecute them. Um, that left them without some things. And so Paul sent Timothy back later, and we'll read about this in chapter 2 and 3. He sent Timothy back later to go care for them and to get word, and he got word, and he was actually really encouraged by what he heard from Timothy. Um, but now he's writing them a letter, and this letter is in response to what he heard from Timothy. Now Paul is in Corinth when he's writing this letter, and it's probably about AD 51. So for perspective, if you're over 35 in the room right now, um, and you were over 35 in the church at Thessalonica, you would have been an adult when Christ went to the cross. It was about 18 years after Christ went to the cross. That is a short amount of time. I was trying to look it up this week. Um, what were some significant things that happened in 2006 to kind of gauge it? Nothing significant happened in 2006. Um, 2005, Hurricane Katrina, 2007, the iPhone was invented. 2006, like Lance Armstrong won his seventh title. It was nothing. Or Lance, yeah, Lance Armstrong. Yeah, nothing happened in 2006. But 18 years ago is when Christ went to the cross. Um, that's how close this church is to the death of Christ and to knowing that. Um, and so tonight, we want to look at how Paul cares for this church. And we're going to look at nine different ways that a loving shepherd, this loving shepherd is Paul, assures and instructs the church that he left behind. We're going to start with some assurances about what they know and then move on from there. And so I've got this split up 
into three sections, um, but there's nine points. So as you kind of work through, when we hit section B, it'll start with point four or something like that. So um, that's the least confusing way I knew how to organize it. Um, originally, I had it different and confused myself. So hopefully, this is easier to follow. And so the first section are assurances from a loving shepherd. And so Paul's first assurance is to assure them of the gospel work that was in their lives. Um, this is, comes out of the first chapter. Paul saw the gospel work in their lives in significant ways, even when he was there for a short amount of time. Look at me, look with me at verse three. Paul says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ before our God and Father. This is one of the first times in all of scripture where Paul mentions his common trifecta of faith, hope, and love. In Paul's mind, these are inseparable from each other and inseparable from one who has been saved. And here he puts some color on them by using them as objects of prepositional phrases. Work of faith, labor of love, steadfastness of hope. I'm not sure that English do these phrases justice. What Paul is getting at here is that he observed actions within their lives that are evidence of their salvation. Look at verse 4. Knowing, beloved, by God, your election. Paul saw a work in them that was produced by faith. He saw a labor in them that was characterized by a supernatural hope, or by love. And he saw a perseverance in them that could only be generated by a supernatural hope in the Messiah. As a loving shepherd, Paul opens the letter with assurances that God has done a supernatural work in them. One that God himself chose to do in his election of them. One that is rooted in the trifecta of faith, hope, and love. As you're sitting here tonight, think about your life. If someone came and visited, would their report of you be like this? Does someone see labor as an outpouring of love in your life? What about work that can only be described as being rooted in your faith? Do you show a steadfastness or perseverance that is based on a hope in your Savior? And I'm not just asking you if these exist in your heart, but I'm asking if someone looked at you and observed your life, are these things that they would say, man, I know that God saved them because I see these things in their lives. This is what Paul saw in Thessalonica, and he gave them an assurance of it. And that leads us to the other assurance, or another assurance that Paul gave to encourage the church at Thessalonica. He assured them that their transformation of life is having a gospel impact. Read with me, chapter 1, starting in verse 5. God's word says, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full assurance, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became a model to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. This actually may be my favorite three-verse section in the book. Paul affirms God's election of them, not just from their response to the gospel, but also with the way the gospel was preached to them and the men that preached it. The gospel was preached with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. The gospel was preached by men who were changed by the gospel. And so this gospel spread. Verse 8, for the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith towards God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. Paul and, the mission, and his missionary team went to Thessalonica, lived a life transformed by the gospel, shared the gospel with them, and this caused them to change such that they didn't need to go further out. 
as they, as this church was changed, just word of what happened here caused other people's lives to change. And that's what God loves to do. God loves to change people's lives with people who have had their lives changed. And so he assured them that their transformation didn't just change the way they did the things they do every single day, but their transformation had a gospel impact. And then the next assurance he gave the church at Thessalonica was that their relationship also had a gospel impact. And when I say their relationship, I mean the relationship between Paul, Silas, Timothy, and the church at Thessalonica. Look at chapter 2. It says, For you yourselves know, starting in verse 1, brothers, that our entrance to you was not in vain. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much struggle. Paul reminded them of this relationship in two parts throughout this chapter. And both of those parts point them back to the gospel. The first part is is highlighting their relationship with each other. Look at verse 4. Paul and his traveling partners were entrusted with the gospel. So they nearly sacrificed their own lives to share it with the church there. And the church at Thessalonica stood firm in the gospel. So much so that their testimony spread. But Paul didn't rest in that. He wanted to ensure them of how they received it and how God sent it to them. And so he gives a testimony of himself. And he gives a testimony of himself marked by significant character traits. Paul says he came without error or deceit. He came not to please men, but under the witness of God. Paul came not with flattery or greed, but as a nursing mother with fond affection, not just in word, but in their lives, behaving devoutly, righteously, and blamelessly towards the church. And he did that with one goal in mind. Look at verse 12. So that they would walk in a manner worthy of the God who called them into his kingdom and glory. What are your relationships like with non-believers? Are you marked by these things? This passage convicted me. It's convicted by the phrase with fond affection. Look at verse 8. In this way, having fond affection for you, we were pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become beloved to us. He's speaking at the church of Thessalonica, but he's describing a time before they were transformed. He's describing the time when he brought the gospel to them and they were not yet saved. And that's why it's convicting. It's easy for me to love believers. It's easy for me to love you guys. Um, It's hard to step into the lives of non-believers so that our lives can go up against their lives and they can be transformed by the gospel. And that's the relationship he's talking about here. And then he assured them that this relationship had gospel impact. What happened in Thessalonica? They became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus. Put another way, they suffered well. They were firm in their faith, faith, and the gospel impacted them. What is the gospel's impact on your life? Here at GBC, my favorite time of year, it happens a couple of times, are baptisms. And I love it because I love to hear the gospel's impact on people's lives. A good testimony is marked by a few things. A good testimony, you describe what you were like before God entered your life. What did you need to be saved from? And then you talk about how God and the gospel truth came into your life and changed you. When and how did you learn the gospel and what is the gospel? And then you close a testimony with how you are a new creation in Christ and how the gospel has changed everything in your life and your heart. I want to give you guys homework this week. Go home and write out your testimony. Write it out with this in mind. And then assure and comfort yourself with how the gospel impacted your life. And if you cannot do that, email me, call me. I'd love to sit down with you and share with you how the gospel can 
impact your life. Moving on to verses, um, chapter 2, really starting in verse 16, and then most of chapter 3, we have a bit of a transition here. It's a very personal part of this letter. Here we find out some interesting details about their visit and their continuing relationships. Paul's practice was to speak first at the synagogues and then to the Gentiles. But we learn here that they were driven out before they got a chance to speak to the Gentiles. Acts 17.4 tells us that a great multitude of God-fearing Gentiles became a part of this church. But, and Paul tried, or at least planned, to return to them after he was driven out. But it seems that the Jews that chased him away were keeping him out. And somehow, Timothy wasn't famous enough to have to worry about that. So he was able to visit back. Um, I've seen some commentators talk about, well, he must not have been there, and that's why he was able to visit. I don't think so. I think when you kind of trace the story, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me that Timothy kind of held out. Um, I think Timothy just wasn't that famous. I think Paul, I'm not even certain that the Jews even saw Paul. They just know his name, know he's the one that's causing all this trouble, um, and were after him. And so Timothy was able to go back possibly twice, um, and he was able to be both an encouragement to the church at Thessalonica as well as to Paul um, so that he could get a report of what was going on. Uh, let's look at chapter 3, verse 6. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always remember us kindly, longing to see us just as we also long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through your faith. For now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. And then Paul closes chapter 3 with almost a benediction here. Let's read that benediction starting in verse 11. Now may our God and Father and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people. Just as we also do for you so that he may strengthen your hearts, blameless in holiness, before our God and Father, at the coming of the Lord Jesus, with all his saints. Paul is saying here, Brothers, I wish I could come to you and shepherd you in person, and I will be there if the Lord wills. But in the meantime, heed these instructions, and chapter 4 and 5 will serve in my absence. This is clearly a transition, and I believe this chapter is here to affirm that Paul received the report from Timothy and that he's ready to respond to what Timothy told him about the church. Basically, I think chapters 1 through 3 are connected to Paul's time with the church in Thessalonica, and chapters 4 and 5 are a response to Timothy's report. And so this benediction serves as a transition to that report, which is why I have a B here for our section heading. Eventually, um, these are instructions from a loving shepherd. And these instructions are introduced with an encouragement from chapter four, verse one. Finally, then, brothers, we ask and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you may excel, excel still more. And so Paul gives some instructions here. Um, and different categories of instructions. And the first one I've categorized as comforting instructions on moral purity. Looking at verse 3, he says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. This is the will of God, your sanctification. Abstain from sexual immorality. This is one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. Every person in this room should have this verse memorized. God's will is that we be sanctified. And to narrow it further, we must abstain or flee from sexual immorality. We live in a world where sexual immorality is the norm. Um, it, is, it is shocking to me how rampant sexual immorality is and how for us to even say that it is immorality it's considered hate speech. Um, 
I, you know, have a coffee shop. At some point, I spoke out against wanting to participate in the Chandler Chamber of Commerce because they had a rainbow flag on their logo. And I said, I don't want to associate with that. Um, over the next 48 to 72 hours, I probably got 100 direct messages of people angry at me for doing that. Um, the letter leaked. It went all over. We finally got our two one-star Yelp reviews that say Matt hates the LGBTQ plus community um, removed from the website because calling it, I didn't even call it sexual immorality. I just said I didn't want to be associated with it. And that um, drove hate. Um, God hates sexual immorality. God's will in our life is to flee from it. We need to um, not sear our conscience away from it. We need to recognize as we see it, and we need to flee. Um, God has revealed precisely what his will is for us. He has revealed his mind and will to us through his commands. Isn't it ironic that we spend hours trying to figure out what God's will is as it relates to buying a house or changing jobs or what school to put our kids into? But when it comes to battling sin, we don't take God's will nearly as serious. I think it would do us all good to spend some time thinking about how God's will for our life is holiness. God has a revealed will for your life in his commandments, and his will is our sanctification. The next instruction from Paul is, is a comforting instruction on selfless discipline. Look at chapter 4, verse 9. Now concerning love of brothers, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed you do practice it towards all the brothers who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to excel still more. There's that phrase again, excel still more. What an encouraging way to give instructions. He then goes on in verse 11 with how to love. This is interesting. He says, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and to attend to your own business and work with your hands just as we commanded you so that you will walk properly towards outsiders and not be in any need. Verse 11 seems like a weird transition, but I believe it's grammatically connected to the discussion on brotherly love in the preceding verses. D. Edmund Hibbert's commentary says it like this, brotherly love is the subject of the whole passage issuing firstly in hospitality, secondly in every man recognizing his Christian duty to contribute his share of honest work to the community as a whole. Riggenbach well remarks that the new exhortation is added with a view to saving brother brotherly love from being damaged. Our faithful performance of the everyday duties of life is intimately related to our love of our brothers. Stated more succinctly, we can love each other by putting our head down and working hard and not being a burden to those around you. It's the dichotomy of the Christian life. We love each other by fulfilling each other's needs, and we love each other by working hard to not be the one that has needs to be fulfilled. And this requires selfless discipline. The sixth point and the next comforting instruction is about Christ's return. This is the passage that fed the song that we sang. Um, although this whole chap, this whole book is just riddled with references to Christ's return. Um, but let's read 1 Thessalonians 4.13. But we knew, do not want you to be uninformed brothers about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another 
with these words. Somehow, I remember when I was about 10, and there were a bunch of adults over at my house, um, probably a Bible study or something my parents were leading, and, um, and several of them, probably five or six, probably 35 to 45 year olds, were sitting there debating eschatology. And they were talking about whether they were pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, um, what the millennial reign was like, and they were going back and forth. And then they turned to me, this like 10 or 11 year old kid, and said, what do you think, Matt? I don't know why I remember this so vividly, but I do. So here we go. And I said, um, I clearly remember saying this. The Jews missed Jesus the first time because they were caught up in the details and didn't know their Savior. My goal at this point is to just learn to recognize Christ so I don't miss him when he comes back. I was quite proud of that response at the time. It kind of shut up the whole group and conversation. And frankly, I used that as a template for why I didn't need to study eschatology for many years following that. I was dead wrong. Dead wrong. There is great eschatology in this passage, and it is sandwiched by two very important phrases. Verse 13, we do not want you to be uninformed brothers about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as those as do the rest who have no hope. Comfort one another with these words. The meat in the middle of the comfort sandwich is the truth about the second coming of Christ. This is a source of hope and comfort to a believer. We must know these things. We are so blessed as a church to be studying Revelation in depth because this is what we must know. So what does this passage teach us about Christ's return? The question the church at Thessalonica needed answered was, what will happen to the dead in Christ? The reply that Paul gives in this passage implies that between the foundation of the church and the return of Timothy, some member or members in the church had died, and this event caused much sorrow for the people. And so at the moment of confronting the reality of death, the Thessalonians did not allow their confession to inform their reaction to this human tragedy. They may simply have not fully understood the reality of the resurrection from the dead, especially in, light, in, in the light of the fact that general um, Gentile consensus was that this did not happen. So Paul gives them comforting instructions on Christ's return. And there are a couple of key points that Paul used to encourage the church. First, in verse 14, Christ said, Christians who die before Christ's return will be risen up with him. And then in verse 16, he comforts them by giving us a clear detail of the glorious fashion in which Christ will return. This passage is on the rapture. Caught up, or hapazo, from verse 17 is translated rapturo in Latin, and that's the basis of the English word rapture. This, this is where rapture is in your Bible. It basically means to snatch or seize, to take something away suddenly. And without this turning into an entire sermon on rapture, I want to point out two verses in 1 Thessalonians that I believe begin a strong case for the rapture coming prior to the tribulation. Look at 1 Thessalonians 1.10. It says, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. We're learning on Sunday mornings about God's wrath being poured out. And this verse clearly states that God will save us from that wrath. And then jumping to chapter 5, verse 9. Paul says, for God has not appointed us for wrath but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Matt Wehmeyer explains it this way. Although the church certainly experiences trials, persecutions, and suffering in this life, God has promised to deliver them from the wrath he, wrath he will pour out upon the earth during the seven-year tribulation, which implies, of course, that the rapture will occur prior to that time. Let's keep moving in chapter 5 and talk about the day of the Lord a little bit. 
And this is our seventh point. It's comforting instructions on the day of the Lord. Paul apparently taught them some teaching when he was with them on the day of the Lord, before he had to flee. Verse 1 sounds to me like he's referencing something he had already taught them. Let's read it together. Now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying, peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them like labor pains upon a woman who is pregnant, and they will never escape. He is very intentional with the pronoun they. The day of the Lord is not for the church. He's speaking to the church and using the word you. But when he's talking about the day of the Lord, he's talking about them. And he reassures the church that they are not the you. I think that works. Remember, Paul's purpose in chapter 5 is to comfort the church with truths about Christ's return. In fact, he does it again. Look at verse 9. For God has not appointed us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. And how does he close this section? Comfort one another and build up one another, just as you also are doing. In November, Smed taught a two-part lesson on the day of the Lord that was really, really helpful. If you have more questions, I urge you to go listen to it. Um, it's a comforting truth for believers. And we look at this section. We see in chapter 4, we see here, we see three different distinct verses where he basically creates a double-decker sandwich of theology all around comforting with this these truths. Learn these things. They are a comfort. And that leads us to the second half of chapter, second half of chapter five. And this takes a dramatic turn in the book. I have my Lagos library set up so that it highlights all the verbs based on mood. And so um, if you see an imperative verb, then it's orange. If you see an indicative verb, it's yellow. If you look at this book, the first like four and a half chapters are all yellows and pinks and not orange. And then you hit this and it's just orange, 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 orange throughout the rest of the second half of the chapter. It just jumps out. The transition just jumps out at you. That a shift made was made in the grammar. And so an imperative verb normally expresses a command. Those were the orange ones. And an indicative verb is the action or the state that's being described. It's like a statement of belief. And so the book is filled with yellow verbs, 94 of them in the 73 verses prior to, to 513. Whereas Paul commands the church with imperatives three times in that same section, and we've been talking about it. Build one another up, comfort one another, and comfort one another. Those are the only commands in the first four and a half chapters of this book. And then in the final nine verses, or before the closing, he gives 15 commands. I think of this closing, closing as a machine gun of commands. And so the first section I call imperatives of biblical fellowship. Read with me 1 Thessalonians 5.12. But we ask of you, brothers, that you know those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord and admonish you, and that you regard them highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. I've taught an entire build passage on just these few verses, and I'm not going to try to do that today, but I want to make a couple of observations. He describes three types of people. He describes unruly, faint-hearted, and weak. An unruly person is one who knows God's commands and chooses to not obey them. And he tells us to admonish those people. A faint-hearted person is one who may know the commands and are just tired. They've just been working hard to obey God, and they just need encouragement. It is sometimes hard to notice the difference 
but be quick to encourage the faint-hearted. And then he says, help the weak. The weak are usually ones who don't actually know what God's teaching is on that. And so you just bring God's word to bear on them and help them. It's important to know who's in front of you. You must know who is in front of you. This requires listening, patience, love, and care. Memorize this verse and reference it in your head when you sit with believers. Use it as a protection from the default of wanting to confront sin aggressively. In my experience, most sinning Christians fall in the latter two categories. They're either faint-hearted or weak. And so help them, encourage them. But if you have an unruly person in front of you, it is a command to admonish them. And then the last section tonight, we're going to talk about imperatives of life transformation. These are in verses 14 through 26, and really 16 through 22 is what I've highlighted. Eight quick commands that Paul shot off like a machine gun that he didn't want the church to miss out on. I'm going to read them. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. But examine all things. Hold fast to that which is good and abstain from every form of evil. Look at those verses and think about what God's or what Paul's asking the church to do and in turn what God's asking us to do. He's telling us to have an attitude of joy and prayer, giving thanks to God. We don't want to quench the spirit, but we want to listen to the spirit. We don't want to despise God's word, but we want to examine it and be in it. And we want to hold fast to things that are good and flee every form of evil. As I've thought and prayed about what do you guys need to take home tonight and what do I need to take home tonight, there are a few truths from this book that have jumped out at me. The first one, don't forget the story of how God saved you. There's much comfort brought in knowing and meditating on the supernatural work that God did in your life to bring you to himself. You were entrusted with the gospel. Share it. Let your life be a testimony of the gospel around you. Can you say to the lost around you, God's word is true because of the person I've proven to be in your midst? Prove to be that person. God's will is your sanctification. Don't forget that. Eschatology matters. Cherish this time in the life of Grace Bible Church where we're spending a lot of time going deep into eschatology. It is sweet and it matters and it is a comfort. And finally, care for one another with God's word. Let me close our time in prayer. Lord God, what a sweet letter from a loving shepherd who got snatched away from his sheep in a context and way that he did not want. And yet you knew this was what was best for the church. And so you did it. And then Paul wrote this sweet letter, this letter of comfort and care and assurances that we get to participate in and see and learn and live our lives um, through its lens, Lord. What a blessing it is to have your word um, in written form so we can spend time learning about you and learning how to love each other and honor you. Lord, what a blessing it's been to be in this book this, at this time, Lord. Help us all to go home tonight um, affected by what you've taught us, Lord. In your name, amen.